have I ever read the Bible? No. I haven't read the Bible. For my own reasons, no. I've skimmed it. I have read the Bible. I kind of looked at little segments, but I've never actually attempted to read, read the whole thing. <laughs> it's not advertised enough, like I don't go to church, so the time when I do read it is when I'm in church, but other than that, like, I don't have a copy of the Bible. They're interesting stories, like as a guide for people how to live, not necessarily taken literally. I thought it was daunting. It's just, it's been a long time, so I don't really remember everything. The story of Adam and Eve. Yeah, Adam and Eve. Like the stories about uh, Jesus and his life. Of, there, of course, the Genesis. I don't know the difference between sort of like the different books and stuff, um, but I do know Genesis is the first one. Or is that an argument? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what goes through your mind when um, someone talks about the Bible or someone gives you a Bible, you hear it. Do you think it's sort of outdated, boring, full of contradictions, full of weird stuff, odd names that you can't mention? And actually, it's not relevant to me whatsoever. If you did, that's what I thought for almost 39 years, nearly 40 years of my life. The first time I encountered the Bible was in a courtroom in Manchester, a magistrate's court, and I had to place my hand on that Bible and swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. Soon after that, I was given a prison sentence, and I was sent off to a prison called Risley, which was a detention center, Borstal then, uh, just outside Manchester. I was born into a, a very dysfunctional family indeed. Both my parents were alcoholics, both were atheists, and both came from Liverpool. <laughs> my father was big and unpredictable. My mother, small and volcanic. My mum could start an argument in an empty room and win. <laughs> we lived in Manchester on some pretty rough areas. I was born in Salford, so my childhood um, was not brilliant. It, it could have been better. Could have been worse, but it could have been better. Not a great time for me. And having two alcoholic parents will knock most things out of you, especially any hope or trust that you might have had in yourself or in other people. At 15, really, two things happened to me simultaneously. One, I was expelled from school. I went to a comprehensive, and it was a, it was a nightmare. I was bullied in there, so I ended up getting expelled for truancy. And at the same time that happened, I got in the middle of an argument with my mum and dad. They used to argue all the time for obvious reasons. And one Sunday, I got in the middle of this argument, and I got the clout that my mother was going to get, and my father threw me out. And in my arrogance and youth, I thought, I'm off. It's got to be better out there than, than it is in there. So I was homeless for a while, not long, but I know what it is to be homeless. And then I moved into a, a squat, an empty house in a place called Stockport. That kind of had an effect on me, and it led me into crime, petty theft at first, and over the years that led to fines, uh, court appearances, bound over to keep the peace, probation. I couldn't pay the fines because I was unemployed for most of my early years. Uh, I didn't go to the probation. So in the end, that's what happened. I went to prison. I came out of prison and headed home, actually. Prison was a, an awful experience uh, for me, and I wanted to get back to my parents. When I got home to where I was last living and knocked on the door, uh, someone else uh, answered. And I found out from them, actually, that my parents had moved out and they'd both got divorced. My father had gone to Manchester and my mother back to Liverpool. It's then while living in a bedsit and holding down a couple of jobs, um, I saw a poster for the army. Uh, and it said, do you want a life of adventure? And it was two soldiers skiing and it looked brilliant. And uh, I thought, I do. Do you know what I mean? I do. So I parked my vehicle and I went into the recruiting office and I said, I want to do the stuff that they're doing with all the skiing and everything, and where do I sign? Because I had a, a prison sentence, I had to go through a lot of interviews, a lot of persuading people. And finally, I was given the, the opportunity to enlist. It was one of the greatest days in my life. And that was my second encounter with the Bible. This time I had to swear allegiance to the crown and put my hand on that Bible. I then received uh, a day's pay and uh, I was in. Uh, my career started in the army. At 21, I was posted to Germany. I got married. At 22, uh, my son Clinton was born, which was a, was a great day. 
At 25, I couldn't handle the responsibility of being um, married and also trying to be a father. I couldn't do those two things. So I ended up getting divorced. I sent my wife and child um, back to the UK. And I didn't see Clinton, my son, for over 10 years. Why? Because I couldn't handle the responsibility, to be honest. When I'd spend a day with him and I'd take him back to his mom, my ex-wife, and I'd hand him over, he'd spontaneously burst into tears. And I was a coward. I couldn't handle it. So I never saw him again for a long time. I ran away from any sort of responsibility like that. I couldn't do it. At 27, I got married again. That lasted just over 18 months, and then another divorce at 29. And that was my life, really. Beneath all this sort of bravado, there was pain, there was broken promises, and there was numerous broken relationships. It was full of drink, debt, divorce, and looking back, really, mostly despair. The only stable thing I had was my career in the military, and, and I loved it. I excelled in it. It was fantastic. And I spent over 16 years in the military doing anything, really, that came my way. That was postings, uh, courses. I volunteered for two tours in Northern Ireland. I volunteered for the advance party to go down to the Falklands. I was in four different regiments. And my last four years were with the Army Physical Training Corps. I became a PT instructor. So eventually, I did do the skiing. The Army physically saved my life, no doubt about it, but morally, and spiritually, I was completely bankrupt. I had no idea of what a moral compass was or anything. I left the army and started work in the fitness industry. The PT Corps had trained me up. I became a personal trainer. I managed a couple of uh, health clubs here in London, uh, which were brilliant, great jobs, well paid, fantastic lifestyle, but never really satisfied. Just always sort of restless for, for, for the next thing. A few years ago now, I, I walked in through those doors that you would have come through tonight to, to start an Alpha course. Why? I had absolutely no idea at the time. A friend had uh, told me about it. I struggled with some of the bits, and, and I attended the weekend, which is coming up this weekend, um, which Stephen mentioned. And if you only hear one thing tonight, don't let anything stop you getting on that weekend. It, it, it's an amazing time, but you have to find that stuff out yourself. But... Try it, because it was at that, um, at that seaside resort that I met with God after nearly 40 years, which was a bit of a shock, probably for both of us. I wasn't quite sure that God was um, going to entertain anyone like me with my background, and I've told you a little bit, it's not everything. But the God I met wasn't this sort of vengeful, judgmental God that I'd heard so much about. I met his son, Jesus, and it was overwhelming for me because he seemed to understand me, my background, my education, my dysfunctionality, all that stuff, and, and he didn't judge me. He just loved me unconditionally. And that was a big deal for me. In fact, it still is that he would love me as I am. And since that weekend, really, my life started to change. Slowly, not overnight, but it started to change. Some of my fears started to leave me. My anxiety started to leave me alone. I, I tentatively started to trust people. I eventually let hope back into my heart again. But my life really started to change. I married my girlfriend. We'd lived together for eight years for obvious reasons, a bit marriage phobic. I got my relationship back with my son, Clinton, I've now got a daughter, Phoebe, who's 20 and gorgeous. And I'm doing what I believe God has called me to do. Working in prisons, working with prisoners, homeless, ex-offenders, addict, addicts, people who Jesus seemed to knock around with, if you read the Bible. And also in 2002, after three years of training, I was ordained into the Church of England as a, a priest. How that happened, I'm still not sure. How does all that sort of change come about, which I've quickly thrown at you? Well, it started for me when I started to listen and listen to God and take some guidance from some people around me and actually start to read this book, the Bible, open it and dare to start to look in it. And both of those things, guidance and that book, were a real humbling experience for me. But now I don't really care how God works. I'm tired of trying to overthink it or work it out. 
I'm not bothered anymore because I know he works in our lives. Otherwise, I wouldn't be stood here before you as a changed man. There's still a lot of work to do, but he's done a lot of work, and I can't be bothered working out how he does it. He just does it. And some facts about the Bible I, I had no idea about. I didn't know that it's a very popular book. It's the most successful book of all time, if you look it up. Over 5 billion have been printed. Over 100 million Bibles are sold or given away every single year. It's the bestseller every year. And the Times newspaper in 2007 said this, simply put, the Bible is the most influential book ever written. I also didn't know that it's a, a very powerful book. One former prime minister described the Bible as highly explosive. It has an impact on people who read it. One guy I knew in prison when I first started this work used to sleep with the Bible um, under his head. He'd sleep on it. And when I spoke to him, I said, what are you doing with the Bible stuck on your head? He said, I want this stuff to go in. So if I sleep on it, it will start to filter in. But actually, he wasn't far wrong because Einstein said, I want to know the thoughts of God. And that's what Frank, my friend, was trying to do. I didn't really know that it's um, a very precious book. On her coronation, the queen was presented with a copy of the Bible, and these words uh, were said over her. We present you with this book, the most valuable thing this world affords. The book itself, the Bible, is just a, it's just a book with pages and, and words on it. It's just a means to an end. And that's why for... Well, over 20 years, I, I carried this book around, this little Bible that I, I signed on when I joined the army, and I put my hand on it. I had it all the time, but I couldn't understand it. I had no idea what it was trying to say to me, but for some reason, I've still got it. And when I tried to read it many times in Northern Ireland when I was terrified, all the Falklands when I was scared stiff, all in various operations, I've always had it with me, but I couldn't understand it, even when I left the army. I still have it and tried to read it. I couldn't understand the word it was trying to say to me, and now I know why, because I had no relationship with the author, God. I didn't know him because nobody had ever told me about him. I also didn't know that it's an inspired book. Jesus says in the scripture, it is written, people do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You know, material things alone don't really satisfy. I've tried lots of stuff. I've filled my life with most things you can possibly think of. Even the best human relationships don't ultimately satisfy. And I've tried quite a few of those as well. There's a spiritual hunger in us. There's a longing for God. And it can manifest itself in, in so many different ways in, in our lives. But in every human heart, we need a relationship with our Creator. And God is longing to communicate with us, to, to be in this relationship with us. And, and sometimes we just don't know because no one's told us about it. It's not our fault. And the primary way that, that God speaks to us is, is through that book you've got in the back of your chairs, is the Bible. St. Paul puts it like this. All Scripture is inspired by God. But what does that mean? The Bible is inspired by God. Well, when you read it, it kind of has a, a ring of truth about it. It proves to be inspired when you put it into practice. You'll find out that some of the things, even the small things that you try and do that it asks you to, really start to work. Like I said, I learned about the Bible on, on the Alpha course that I attended. It's there that I started to understand what it was trying to say to me, what God was trying to talk to me. I didn't know that God had a plan for my life. Reading the Bible one day, I, I came across um, uh, a book in the, in the Old Testament called Jeremiah, and I, and I landed on Jeremiah 29, it's verse 11. And it kind of says this, that God has a, has a good plan for our lives, a, a plan to prosper us and, and not to harm us, and a plan to give us hope. And it was the hope that stuck in my heart, that word. It, it seemed to sort of jump out of the pages at me. And I thought, you know what? I really love plans. I love that God's got some hope for me, whatever it might be. And I started to think maybe prison 
was my plan. Maybe prison was my, my destiny. The Bible is basically broken up in, in, into two books. The, the Old Testament, or two parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the history of the, of the Jewish people. It's an extraordinary story, if you, if you read it, of captivity and of freedom and then of captivity and then of freedom and then fights and skirmishes. It, it's incredible. And then the New Testament really is the life of Jesus and the start of the church. Extraordinary things that he got himself into, the people that were around him. The stories are just extraordinary. It was written over um, 1,600 years by over 40 different people, kings, scholars, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, historians, doctors, normal people put the words on the pages. They wrote in different styles, such as history, poetry, um, poetic stuff, letters. So it's 100% the work of human hands. People had a pen or a quill and they wrote things down. It's a written book. But what the writer is saying in the scriptures is that it's also 100% inspired by God. What would be an example? Sir Christopher Wren, the greatest architect of his time, built St. Paul's Cathedral. But actually, he didn't lay a single stone. He didn't put a piece of wood there. He did nothing at all. There was hundreds upon hundreds of builders stonemasons and chippies and carpenters put that building together. But there was one mind, one architect, one vision, one inspiration behind that building. And that was Sir Christopher Wren. And it's the same with the Bible. Many different writers, one architect, one vision, one inspiration, about it all, God put it together. Written by man, 100% inspired by God. It can be a really difficult read if you start going through it. If you've ever tried to read the Bible, particularly parts of the Old Testament, you find moral difficulties in there, things that you just can't comprehend or put together. There are different kinds of writing in the Bible. Some lean towards the metaphorical. Some are full of imagery and passion, and, and some are poetic. And you have to read it carefully, possibly a few times, to start to understand it. But even after that, we're left with some things that I find really difficult to understand, like the issue of suffering. I mean, that's really difficult, and, and there's no trade answers for that, to believe that, that God is this God of love, and yet every time we turn on the television set or we open a newspaper, all we see is that the world is full of suffering. It's really hard to, to put those two together, and understandably, some people reject the Christian faith because of that dilemma of a God of love and a world that's full of suffering and pain and hurt and violence. What I'm learning is the more I try to wrestle with these big areas, the, the love of God and, and the suffering that we see in our own lives and around the world, and there are no easy answers, but, but the more I try and explore it, the more I try and wrestle with these sort of areas, the greater my understanding, and I believe our understanding, of suffering and love will come together. Not easy, but the more I wrestle, the more I seem to understand. Try and view the Bible as inspired by God and then wrestle with some of these difficulties, some of these moral difficulties that, that are in there that we come across. Don't be scared of them. Ask, seek understanding, and then dive in and try and tackle them. You can do that. I'm getting old now, and one of the things I really like doing and started to do are crosswords. And if you're like me, you can never finish them. They drive me mad. But the thing with a crossword, what I found, and I related it to the Bible, if I get stuck on an issue, on one of the clues in a crossword, you just move on to another bit, and then you do another word, and then you do another word, and then you get a letter of the word that you can't get, and eventually it starts to come together. And eventually, God willing, I may finish one. But it starts to come together. Maybe treat some of these issues like a crossword. Just have a go and keep persevering. It's not easy. And like I said, I still haven't finished working the Bible out at all. Maybe I never will. But all I can say is I would encourage you to wrestle with it and, and tackle it and have a go of it. And don't be scared of it and just sit with it. And God will give you 
advice on how to do that. I also didn't know that the Bible is a, a very practical book when I was introduced to it. The Bible just isn't an inspired book. It's a, a practical book as well. It's been described sometimes as a manual for our life, full of practical wisdom on leading a healthy and fulfilling life. And I really want that, a healthy and fulfilling life. Follow it, and it says this in Isaiah 58, verse 11, and I love this line. If you follow it, your life will be like a well-watered garden. I love that imagery of a well-watered garden, full of life, and, and it's moist, and it's full of color, and an excitement, and a nice place to be in. Now, some might say, look, I don't want to get stuck into that Bible because all that is really is a rule book. I don't want all these rules and regulations. I just want to be free to do exactly what I want to do. And if I follow the Bible, surely I'm going to lose all my freedom and all my choices to do what I want to do when I want to do them. But I would challenge you if you're thinking that and saying, is that right? Is that true? Does the Bible take away our freedom or does it actually give us freedom? An example would be a football match. Someone once called it the beautiful game. But imagine a football match without any rules or regulations. Imagine it without any white lines. Imagine it without a referee. Imagine it without a linesman or a penalty point or a red card or a yellow card or whatever it is. Imagine it with no rule. It would turn into complete chaos. But when you have those guidelines and those rules and those areas where you can go and you can't go, you're free to enjoy the game. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to have a beautiful game of life and really enjoy it instead of it descending into chaos sometimes, which mine certainly did. God has given us those guidelines on, on how to live, not to restrict us and, and be boring and limit us. He wants us to grow and have an excitement in it. He wants to spoil us with love, not spoil our fun, because he loves us and because he wants us to enjoy life, to have a beautiful life. And for me, I've tried living without guidelines, ignoring rules for almost 40 years. And to be honest, you know what? I prefer rules. I prefer boundaries. I prefer know, uh, knowing where I have to go and where I have to stop and what I have to do. I kind of like that. It gives me so much freedom. So it's inspired by God. It's God-breathed. It has the power to change people's lives or I wouldn't be stood here. It's changed mine. It's a and the exciting part is God is still speaking through that book today, tonight. He can change your life tonight, maybe on the weekend, whenever. It doesn't matter if you allow him to. If you start just to dip in to that book. I also didn't know that God speaks to us through the Bible. No one told me that either. The Bible is like a, it's like a love letter. When you get a letter from someone you love, I'm sure you do, you treasure it, not because of the letter itself, it's because of the person who wrote it. When I was in the army, at one point in my career, I spent almost four years in Gibraltar with a regiment out there, so I was, I was separated from my girlfriend, Amanda. And what we used to do was um, write to one another, and, I, and I've still got a lot of the letters. These blueies, they're called, they're the military letters, and uh, we used to send them to each other. And when I saw one of those that arrived in the mail room for me, I got so excited. Why? Not because of the letter, because I knew who was the author. I knew who it was from. I had a love for that person. And then we got more technical, and we went on to little cassettes, which we could get more stuff on. <laughs> <laughs> Get that off. Um, <laughs> I, um, I tried reading one of those letters for my daughter when she was a bit younger, and I was trying to inspire her about romance and poetry and things like this, and I started reading it, and she put her fingers in her ear, and she went, Daddy, Daddy, that's enough. It's making me feel sick. <laughs> so I was excited by those letters because I had a relationship with the author. That's the point. And the whole point of that book, the Bible, is that you might have a relationship with the author, with God himself. As the scripture says again, faith comes through hearing and reading the word of God. And if you want to grow in faith, I can only encourage you to have a go and read it whenever you can. Particularly, as Stephen said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, the Gospels, they're just full of stories. I can't be bothered with all the theology, to be honest. It's just the stories, what these characters get themselves into. Martin Luther said, The Bible is alive. 
It speaks to me. It has hands. It lays hold of me. It has feet. It runs after me. It's an amazing book if you would just allow yourself. So how and when should we read it? Do you know what? There's no rules. There's no regulations. There's nothing at all. Whenever you want to, however you want to, wherever you want to. No particular time, no particular place, whatever. Do it whenever you want to. I'm hopeless at trying to, to set a time and a place which some people recommend. I've just never been able to do it. I try and I always feel, uh, fail. Then I feel bad that I haven't read it. Then I feel guilty and I'm ashamed and it all just goes in a spiral. What I try and do now is read a little bit of it every day. And I try and pray a little bit every day. And if I don't, then it doesn't matter. But I'm trying to do that more often. Try and open it. And I've made this little deal with God that um, my part of the deal is that I will open it and his part of the deal, he's got to help me and inspire me to want to read it. And we're doing all right at the moment. So try and have a plan if you can, really, it's better. Try and find a, a time, maybe 10 minutes a day, five minutes a day, whatever. Try and find a place where creatures of habit somewhere where you're comfortable. Maybe read it when you're traveling, like Stephen said, with the headphones or on the train, the tube, anywhere you want to. Find a pattern if you want to and, and try and get into it to, to encourage yourself. The Bible in One Year app has been extraordinary just, just for myself. It's a brilliant thing, but for me, it's really helped me read the Bible. Um, I put the headphones on, I, I go for a run, and, and it's extraordinary. I don't have to read it, I can listen to the Word of God. I read one of the passages and read Nikki's commentary of um, Pushed. I just read the story at the beginning and, and maybe uh, Pippi, uh, Pippa's comments at the end. Or uh, I even listen now to Nikki's voice reading it. And I use that at night, it's brewing. It sends me straight off to sleep. It's fantastic. <laughs> and I wouldn't worry if you don't understand all of it. Ah, don't worry about that. Just, just, just like the crossword, just keep having a go of it. The main question to ask is, what is God saying to me today? And does the stuff I'm reading apply to my life somehow today? And is it going to help me? If you can get one of those three, then it's worth doing. And the great thing is, if you start tomorrow and read the Bible every day, in a year, you would have read the whole thing. Maybe that's not your thing. It's taken me about five or six years to get through it. I'm still not quite there yet. But if you read a little bit every day, it starts to make up. Don't set yourself unrealistic targets and say, I'm going to try and read a whole book. Don't, because you might fail, and then you'll feel bad. Give yourself five minutes. I'm going to read for five minutes. I'm going to close my eyes and pray for five minutes, and then I'm moving on with the rest of the day. And what I found is if the more you pray and read the Bible, funny enough, the easier it gets to pray and read the Bible. The deeper your relationship with the author becomes, the more you read the Word. It really is the best investment you can ever make. That's all I can really say to you. I mentioned my father at the beginning of this talk. We, we had a, a difficult relationship. He was a, a hard man, a heavy drinker. He was crude, vulgar, big, and like I said, unpredictable and often uh, very violent. Uh, we never really got on, and like I said, at the age of 16, we had this argument, and I left home, and I never really saw him again for, goodness, for so many years. When I became a Christian, I had this desire to see my father. Why? Well, my heart had probably softened a little bit and I wanted to see him. I'd changed. I went to see my father. He hadn't changed one little bit. He just got older and grumpier. And I got this deal with him that I would give him tickets. I'd buy him tickets to come down from, from Manchester to London and stay with us in our house with Amanda and Phoebe. And he'd come down and it would be um, a nightmare. I'd meet him at Euston Station, and the first thing he'd do is complain. He'd complain about money. He'd be slightly drunk as he got off the train. He'd usually say to me, "Eh, son, it'd be nice to travel first class. Well, that's never going to happen with me, is it? Never mind. Just constantly making me feel bad and guilty about things. It got so bad one weekend, I said to Amanda, do you know what? I, I can't do this anymore. I'm really trying to have a relationship with him, but uh, hands up. I'm failing, it's too painful, and it's driving me mad. He would stay with us, and it would be hell. There'd be arguments, there'd be drinking, he'd be rude to Amanda, he'd be rude to, to my daughter, there'd be these long silences, 
There'd be his complaining about lack of money and constantly making me feel guilty. And I said, Amanda, I can't do it. Oh, I just can't do this relationship with him. And she just said to me, do you know what, Paul? You need to pray, which is not what I wanted to hear. And then she said, what you need to do is read the Bible more and ask God how you should be with your father. So I prayed and I read the Bible and it really didn't get any better at all. It was still a nightmare. Having him to stay was awful. The complaining about the tickets, the money, the economy, travel, just everything really. It got so bad with him, I had to get him out of the house. Oh, I had to get out of the house. I left him. He was arguing, and I walked out because I thought I might do something stupid. And I got the, I got the Bible on, on the app, the Bible in one year, and I put it on, and I, and I went for a run, to be honest. And uh, I heard a piece of Scripture. It was from the Old Testament, and it's out of the Ten Commandments. And the bit that stuck in my head is where God's talking to Moses, and he gives him one of the Ten Commandments, and it says... Honor your mother and father. And I thought, you've got to be joking. Honor my mother and father. But I couldn't get the words out of my head. Not an easy scripture for me to honor any of them. But I tried to honor my father. And after a while, it did get a little bit easier. Why? I don't know. His words didn't cut me as much. They didn't hurt as much. They didn't seem to have, a, have as much power. On the Sunday that he was traveling back up to, to Manchester, we took him to the station, and me and Amanda and Phoebe, we, we put him on the train, and Amanda and Phoebe were, were settling him down in, in, his, um, in his seat. And I had this overwhelming feeling of love for my dad. It was really weird, stood in this sort of carriage on, on the train. And I looked at my dad, and I saw on his forehead, honor your father pretty weird thing to see at Euston Station. <laughs> Honor your father. And then my heart started to break from him. I thought, what the heck is going on in here? And what came into my mind is to upgrade his ticket from a basic one to a first class one. We had about 10 minutes to go. I couldn't find a conductor or anything. So I ran off for my credit card and I bought a very expensive single uh, first class ticket to Manchester. I came back on the train, I grabbed my father, he started whinging, where are you going? I grabbed my dad and I walked him into the first class compartment and I sat him down. The whistle or the bell went and we had to get off the, off the train pretty quickly and the, and the doors closed and um, Amanda said, what's going on? I said, you know what, I don't know really, I just wanted to see my dad happy, I wanted to do something for him. And as the train was starting to pull away from the station in the window, I saw my father's face there, and he turned to look at me, and he was in the seat, and he hit the recline button, and it kind of went back. <laughs> then he took his trilby off and put his trilby on the, on the table. Then he put his hand up, and someone brought him some tea or coffee over, and he turned to me, and he had this biggest smile on his face. It was like birthdays, Christmas, Easter, everything had come at once, and the train slowly started to, to pull out. That was the last time I ever saw my father. He, he died three weeks later of a, a massive heart attack on his own in, in Manchester. After all those years of regret, argument, pain, the words, the, the me leaving home, what am I left with? My dad's face. All I can see every time I think of my father is his face looking through that window. Now, was that me, an inspirational thought to buy him a ticket, or was that God? guiding me to have peace with my father through reading that book, that Bible verse helping me to have peace with my father, but more importantly, to have peace with myself. In my opinion, God doesn't override us. He doesn't force us to do anything really, but what he wants to do is, is draw alongside us. He wants to guide us. He wants to help us. He wants to understand that love letter, the Bible that he's written for us. The Bible, for us, he, he gives us life through it. He gives us hope through it. He gives us a sense of excitement through it. It's a manual to have a good, fulfilled, and healthy life that your life might be like a well-watered garden instead of a barren desert place that we sometimes find ourselves in. So maybe next time you open that book, try and say to, to him, to God, you know, I'll do my part, I'll try and open it, and your part is to try and help me understand it. Maybe 
we could do this stuff together. And as it speaks to me, I'll try and put it into action in my life. You just never quite know what will happen when you open that book. It might just change your life forever. <laughs>